Hey folks, um, for those that are joining and I'm just watching the attendee number climb, um, it is exactly noon Eastern time. And so we're going to get started with the webinar in just a brief moment. Um, we have about 200 people who are registered for the webinar today. And so I'm just watching for the attendee number to hit a critical mass. So far, 30 people have joined. Once we get maybe our first 50, I'm just going to dive right in. Um, but I'll give everyone a, a, you know, an extra minute or two before we really start digging into the content. Um, because now that it's noon, I see the number rapidly climbing. Um, so in the meantime, and, uh, and, and while we're waiting for just a few more folks to join, um, I'll just start by a brief introduction of myself and my background. Um, my name is Spencer Jarrell. I'm the founder and CEO of Spark Neuro. Um, my greatest passion in all of life is uh, A, education, which is why I love to do these webinars and why this is so important to me, um, is really being able to educate the industry. But on a deeper level, it's really uh, studying the human brain. It is the most powerful device, the most complex device um, on the planet. Um, it is uh, the future of science. It really is at the forefront of everything that we know. We know much more about all of outer space than we do about the human brain. And, uh, and with that mystery is also great power. And there's incredible work being done in academia, some of which you'll get to see today. Um, however, uh, a lot of that work doesn't make it into real world applications. And that is what I'm really passionate about. My background from an educational perspective is a field that not everyone knows about, a field called human factors. And what is human factors? Human factors is the, st the study of cognitive psychology and human behavior. And how do those things, understanding human beings, how we make decisions, emotion, visual perception, how does that actually impact real world applications? So how do we take the research of cognitive psychology and human behavior and bring it out of academia, break down the walls of the ivory tower and allow this to be something that is accessible and practical for real world applications? Um, that is what I uh, have always studied. That is what I've done for the last 15 years of my career. And it's what I'm most passionate about. And that's why I'm so excited to present to everybody today. Um, and now I see we have quite a critical mass who's joined and people continuing to join. And so what I'm gonna do is go ahead and get started. Um, I will be taking questions at the end of the presentation. Um, and there's a spot for putting questions in. Um, and, uh, and with that, uh, I'm going to go ahead and just start jumping right into the content. Um, and I'm so glad that we have such high attendance so that so many people have joined this webinar. Um, and I'm really, really looking forward to teaching today about emotional decision making. How is it that we make decisions? How is emotion connected to that process? Why is this so important to understand? And the outline of what we'll be covering today is, uh, is the following. Um, uh, and before I actually get right into the outline, I want to start um, by testing the brains of all of the people in the audience. And in order to do this, and hopefully it works well, even with a little bit of a delay over a screen share, is uh, I'm going to need everyone to pay really close attention. I know that during webinars, people can multitask and you have other things distracting you, but for a moment, because this is going to be a 200 millisecond task, a fraction of a second. And I need everyone to really focus on the screen to have a chance at learning the lesson that comes out of this. And this lesson is gonna be something that we bring back later in the presentation in order to uh, help understand the power of the human brain, how it functions, and how we can understand that in the context of measuring engagement, measuring emotion, and uh, doing so directly from the brain, um, and applying that to real world applications, especially advertising and entertainment in the case of this 
uh, webinar and, and what we in the work that we do every day. So you're focused on the screen right now, and I'm going to show you two pictures. First, one will come up right above that one, and then another will come up above the two, but each picture is only going to flash on the screen for 200 milliseconds, 0.2 seconds. So this real quick fraction of a second. And your job is to look at those faces, you really have to focus, and, and then decide which one is more trustworthy. And let's see if you can do that, even with the very limited time that I'm going to give you. All right, here it comes. Okay, so uh, you saw those faces for 200 milliseconds. And I might do this in front of a big crowd. Recently, I did this in front of a crowd of about 200 people live. And I said, raise your hand if you thought number one was more trustworthy. And I'll just play that one more time. And raise your hand if you thought number two was most trustworthy. And for number one, out of 200 people in the audience, and I see people raising their hand digitally as well, um, uh, and that's great. Um, out of 200 people in the audience, only three or four people raised their hand for number one. Whereas the rest of the entire audience raised their hand for number two. And if you were having the same experience, you probably also said, wait, number two seems more trustworthy. Now here's what's amazing. You only saw that for 200 milliseconds, a small fraction of a second. And yet you were able to make a judgment. You were able to judge who's more trustworthy in that small fraction of a second. And so you're making these subconscious judgments in really short amounts of time. And that is really the power of the human brain and what it is capable of doing even beyond um, your own awareness, even at small, small fractions of time. Now let's just play the game one more time. Here it comes. All right, that was just a little bit for fun. That one was only 100 milliseconds. And you saw two characters from Aladdin. Hopefully you know which one is more, more trustworthy. Um, what's really fascinating about this is that although I just showed you what 200 milliseconds looks like and what 100 milliseconds looks like, you can actually make trust judgments about people's faces in as little as 33 milliseconds. Now, let me contextualize why that is such an astounding thing and the implications of that level of judgment that quickly. First of all, to even begin visually processing information, it takes about 30 milliseconds for a stimulus to uh, be received by your eye and then travel to the back of your head, your occipital lobe, where you begin to process visual information. And so this 33 milliseconds, it's still subliminal. It's completely subconscious. When people look at a face and I say, which was more trustworthy, one or two, and you only saw it for 33 milliseconds, that you say, well, it was two. And I say, but what did you see? And you can't even consciously describe that you saw something. And so the brain is just incredibly powerful. And it can do quick judgments based on these gut instincts at an incredible rate. And, and is, uh, that is what has me so obsessed with studying the human brain and everything we can learn from measuring. So with that in mind, we'll now set the stage for what are we going to go over today? Now that everyone's hopefully just excited about the power of the brain and wanting to dig in and learn more. So first of all, we're just going to uh, get everyone on the same level playing field. Um, uh, introduce what is neuro research? How is it conducted? What do the results look like? How do we get that? Um, we're going to go over then how do emotions and decision making actually connect to each other? How does that work? How do you make decisions? Do emotions play an impact in that? If so, how? Um, what about rational decisions versus emotional decisions? We're going to dig into that. Then we're going to say, okay, but what's the impact on advertising? How do I take what we know, and knowing that the majority of our audience is coming from advertising and entertainment, how do we take that and say, this are, these are lessons that I'm going to apply in order to make sure that I optimize the power of my advertising? And speaking of the power, we're then going to get into, well, how, how powerful is this really? Can we actually take brain data and then predict actual real world outcomes? If you are an advertiser, um, if you are an agency, 
you're looking for advertisement to actually deliver on increasing sales or increasing brand affinity. And so can brain data predict what happens in the real world? That'll be the next thing that we look at. So that's our agenda for today. Um, in actuality, a lot of what we're covering is really deep science. It's really complex concepts. But my job is to try to break that down in the most user-friendly, fun, digestible way as possible. But there will be moments where I say, okay, stop multitasking for a second because this is a complex thing that I want everyone to really get their head around. So let's just start with like, what is neuro research? What is neuroscience research in its practical application? And that begins with just talking about very briefly who we are. None of this is educational. None of this should feel like a sales pitch. Um, but essentially what Spark Neuro does is we measure brain activity, other biometrics in order to understand how engaging is your storytelling, whether that be advertising, entertainment, um, and all of the other sectors that we work with. Um, and we do that um, not through just the traditional means of surveys and focus groups. And the industry at large has already recognized some of the flaws and biases that come along with surveys and focus groups. Now, that's not to say they're not useful at all. In fact, they are part of our standard process. We do want to hear what people say. It's just the way that we go about surveys, the way we go about asking people is different. And it's supported by actual measurement of brain and other nervous system activity so we can dig into a deeper truth. And so the biases of uh, focus groups, for example, you're familiar with, things like groupthink. Um, you know, you have one person in the room in a focus group who happens to be pretty charismatic and confident and everyone says, yeah, what she said, I like that. Um, and, uh, and that really sways the crowd because, um, because people are really kind of banding together as a group and that's groupthink. There are other biases. One of them is social desirability bias, right? You don't want to look not desirable socially. In other words, you want to look cool. You don't want to be judged. And because you want to be judged favorably or look cool, you say things that seem like this is what I should be saying and not necessarily how you truly feel. And so we need to get beyond that. And the critical factor that we're talking about is emotion. Emotion is a really important thing. Attention, memory, these are critical things. Um, and we want to be able to talk about how do we understand these things beyond just what people are able to say in a survey or a focus group. And in order to do that, we use a range of biometric and neuroscience, neurometric devices. The most important of all um, in our research is electroencephalography, EEG, which is reading the electricity that is uh, being emitted through your scalp. Um, we're collecting thousands and thousands of data points per second being emitted directly from your brain in the form of electricity as neurons are firing throughout different locations in your brain in different frequencies and amplitudes. And all of that gets processed real time automatically into measures of attention and emotion. We have other exciting tools we won't get into all the details of in this session, but FNIRS, uh, many of you have not heard of FNIRS. It is another way of looking at brain activity with much higher fidelity in spatial resolution. In other words, what specific regions of the brain are getting more blood oxygenation because of what areas of the brain need to be activated. We're also looking at facial coding. Facial coding alone um, is going to tell you once in a while we see a facial expression and that's relevant. On its own, it's not gonna be enough, but our theory of change is that it's combining all of these things together that really provides power. We also mix in galvanic skin response. You'll hear more about that today. Long story short on galvanic skin response, if your palms are a little bit sweaty, right, when you get a little nervous, a little excited, if I'm engaging you at all right now, then we should see some electricity being conducted through your 
palms and fingers, electrodermal activity, the electricity coming out of your skin. And that's a result of activation of the nervous system. Eye tracking is part of what we do. And we use that not only to say where people are looking, but also to understand um, what are the visual patterns that correlate with engagement and how can we actually measure the extent to which people are engaged um, with the content you're looking at. But we also have a subconscious influence meter, which is a way of uh, understanding survey data from a more subconscious decision-making process. And we mix in surveys, we mix in interviews, one-on-one -on -one qualitative, because we need to bring this all together holistically to provide the most meaningful outputs. What does that look like in action? Well, the setup looks like this. You can see some of the stuff in the background in terms of the equipment. And, um, and you can see that you know, we set people up with an EEG and a GSR and the eye tracking and, and, a, and a webcam reads their facial expression. And as we combine all of these metrics, we're able to say, without asking a single question, Right now, if I had everyone in this audience hooked up, I would say, am I boring you? Am I exciting you? What is your emotional state? Um, and if I saw that I was losing people, I would then suddenly swip, flip to the next slide, which is exactly what I'm going to do. And so then we'd convert all of that data into these lines. Um, the teal line is a measure of attention. The red line is a measure of emotion. And we can analyze on a moment by moment basis exactly where people are engaging, disengaging, and analyze based on all of the other inputs. What does that really mean? Where is that coming from? And why is that? There are times, like for example here, emotion drops to almost zero. In this case, that's not a bad thing. Because first of all, your brain is programmed to return to neutral. Zero on emotional scale is neutral. And most of the time, you, your brain is modulating emotions, controlling your emotions. And that's part of its job. So otherwise, you'd be laughing all the time and crying all the time and screaming all the time. And so your brain's job is to modulate emotions. So we see that there are an, there's an instance where emotion just returns to neutral, but that also sets up for these two major spikes where this ad gets really high emotion and attention for that period of time. And so in this case, that was part of the storytelling process. However, then we see 25 seconds of declining attention and near neutral emotion. Um, and that means that by the time we get to the end of this ad, we see that the branding moment has a bit of an uptick. And that's a good thing. They did something positive in that branding moment, but it wasn't as high as it needs to be for people to really have the highest brand awareness and recall of who's advertising in this case. And so that's how you read the data that's coming out of your brain and your uh, electrodermal activity and these other um, neurological and biometric responses that we're tracking. That is the basics. That is how it all works. Um, and I know that there will be so many questions and we'll have time at the end to take questions, but that gets everybody on a level playing field for what are we talking about when we talk about neuro measurement or neuro analytics, or as some people in the industry say, neuro marketing. Um, and so now we're going to get into what about emotions and decision making? How does that work? And uh, I'm going to ask you guys in the audience to consider the following. I'm presenting to you in one hand an apple and in the other hand a donut. Well, which one is the more rational decision? Which one is the more emotional decision? Now you can imagine, once again, imagine that this conference that I was at recently and there were about 200 people in the audience and I said, raise your hand if you think that the more rational decision is the donut. And out of all 200 people, as you may be experiencing yourself, the more rational decision is the donut. It doesn't quite feel right. And so we see very few hands go up, usually, you know, uh, one wise aleck uh, or two or three, um, but that's about it. And then, okay, what about is the more rational decision than the apple? And now I can imagine in the proverbial uh, raising of hands of people on the webinar, you may be all thinking like, yeah, the more rational decision is the apple. But of course, this is really a trick question. Um, the fact of the matter is, there is no such thing as a purely rational decision. Every decision that you make is inherently emotional. 
Emotion is a significant part of every decision you ever make, and you cannot make any decision in the absence of emotion. The only kinds of decisions, so to speak, that you could make in the absence of emotion would be something like solving a complex math problem. Outside of that, emotion plays an important role. Now let's look back at the apple and the donut. If you thought the donut was the more emotional decision, well, what if your emotions um, thought, well, I wanna feel good about myself. I wanna feel that I'm making healthy choices. Um, maybe the apple is therefore an emotional decision. Maybe you subconsciously saw, even if you didn't notice it until I pointed out, that in the background, there's a stethoscope hanging around a woman's neck, and so there's a doctor back there. And so that may have influenced your decision on this emotional level. Now I've made this grand statement, this idea that there's no such thing as making a purely rational decision. I better back that up, because that is something that wasn't really published and really accepted until we saw the work of Antonio Damasio in 1994 when he released his seminal work, Descartes' Error, which is one of the books that absolutely changed my perspective on everything and made me incredibly interested in pursuing this field. And so now I'm gonna tell you a story um, that really set off some of this incredible research that helps us understand the reason why emotions and decision-making are intrinsically and inherently intertwined no matter what, and there's not a way to separate them. And the story goes like this. Phineas Gage was around in the uh, late 1800s. In the 1880s, he was a railroad worker. He's the guy that you're seeing with the big rod in his hand. And as he was working on the railroad, he, uh, there was a large explosion. And that rod, that same rod that he's holding right there, went through his cheek and shot all the way through the top of his head. And he just, bam, hit the floor. And you can imagine, everyone must assume, like he must be dead because he just had a huge metal rod shoot all the way through a really important part of his frontal cortex. Like he lost a significant part of his brain. And yet, despite losing a significant part of his brain, he actually eventually got back up on his feet. They took him home and he proceeded to live a fairly long um, life. He ended up moving around the world, taking different jobs, but there were a couple things that were weird. One of the weird things, as reported by his wife, was that he really just couldn't control his emotions anymore. Um, it was all over the place. And eventually he just really couldn't even seem to feel emotion anymore. The other thing that was weird was that he could no longer make decisions for himself. He could not make rational choices. And so people would think, well, he lost a big part of his frontal cortex. It must be that he lost the area that is involved in reasoning and ration. But um, it turns out that that wasn't the primary factor. It was the connection between emotion and reason that made him it, unable to even make a single decision. Now, the reason behind this we're gonna get into as we look at more of Damasio's work and talk about what he really discovered when he dug into this and then cases that are much more recent. But the most important way to think about this is as follows. If you were to try to make a rational decision, where do I wanna go for dinner tonight? Should I go out on this date? What should I order off the menu? and you tried to do that based on reason alone, that looks like a big pro and con list, right? It's sort of like, rationally speaking, this thing is healthier, this thing is like, and you could create, based on an infinite number of variables, a never ending sequence of pros and cons for every decision. The cognitive load, the mental effort that would take to make any decision, if you were to go about that approach, would be so overly burdensome that you just could not make decisions. So instead, your gut, your instincts, your emotions are giving you little nudges, pushing you in the right direction. In, in most cases, you're not even really aware of that consciously, but it's helping shortcuts so that you don't have to put so much cognitive effort into every single thing that you do every day by making these like giant 
reasoned out rational pro and con lists. It's impossible to do, and so we rely on emotion. So next time somebody says to me, that's an emotional decision, you should stop making emotional decisions. That's actually not right. It's not the right advice. Emotion, you have evolved for millennia, since the beginning of time of humanity, um, in order for emotion to be a contributing factor to allow you to make decisions. It is important to understand how those emotions are driving you, but it is part of the decision-making process. It is not a bad thing. It's the greatest advantage that you have in being able to make good decisions. That's why people say things like, trust your instincts, trust your gut, your emotions are smart. Now let's dig into the science. Let's look at, a, at an academic study, and my job is to take this academic study, which is really complex, and the results of it are incredibly complex, and to, and to explain it in a way that still does service to the complexity of it, but also makes it accessible and fun and easy to understand. So this is an area where I'm gonna ask people to like, okay, multitasking tasking down for a second because you know, hopefully I'm engaging you enough. I wish I could be measuring your brain activity right now um, so that we could really make sure that uh, we pay attention to this next part. Demacio, now we're talking in the, you know, uh, 90s, not too long ago. Um, he had six patients who had brain damage in the ventromedial prefrontal cortex. Now, if I go back to Phineas Gage, the guy that got the rod through his head, ultimately what he lost was his ventromedial prefrontal cortex, right? this area of the brain that is incredibly important. And there were these six other patients that as a neurologist and neuroscientist, Damasio had, who had brain damage in that exact same reason. Most of these patients had a tumor and they had to get that part of their brain removed in order to save themselves from a brain tumor. And so that's a horrible thing, but in the scientific community, when somebody is missing a part of their brain, uh, it provides an opportunity. It provides an opportunity to study that and see, well, what happens if you're missing this part of the brain? And so Damasio um, and his colleagues, including his wife, who is also a prominent neuroscientist, so two Damasios, um, uh, looked into this and conducted an experiment where they took these six participants who are missing the same area of the brain that, that Phineas Gage was missing because of the railroad accident and compared their brain activity for a particular task, which he'll show you in a moment, to, to a, a set of subjects that had normal, healthy human brains with no lesions, no missing part, no damage to the ventromedial prefrontal cortex. So they all got to play a game, and here's how the game worked. They set up the Iowa gambling task. The way the Iowa gambling task works is you get laid out in front of you four decks of cards. So imagine it, imagine it in your mind. You have four decks of cards laid out in front of you, and you start drawing from these decks. And every time you draw another card, you pick it up and you say, oh, uh, I just want a dollar. Awesome. And then you pick up a different card. And so, oh, I just lost a dollar. Darn it. And each deck has sometimes you'll win, sometimes you'll lose, sometimes you'll win a dollar, sometimes you'll win five dollars, sometimes you'll lose five dollars. And at first it seems very random. What the participants don't know is that actually two of the decks overall, although there's some loss, some win, they're overall like these two decks are just better. You win more, you lose less. And these are like the better decks. And then there's these other two decks that are the worst, that are the, the bad decks, the ones that you don't want to draw from. But you don't know that as a participant. You're just drawing from the decks and seeing like, how do I win this game? How do I get the most money? Knowing that sometimes I'm going to draw a card and win some money. Sometimes I'm going to draw a card and lose some money. But two of the decks are the ones that you should be going for. And can you figure that out? So that's how the game works. And remember when I talked about galvanic skin response before, also known as electrodermal activity? This is the core technology used in a lie detector. The way that it works, um, and it's the very same device that I have right here, um, it actually uh, allows us to understand that when you become a little, let's say a little nervous, right, a little excited, 
very microscopic amounts of sweat, micro siemens of sweat, uh, may be present in your, in, across your skin, especially sensitive in your palms and fingers. And that sweat is a result of activation of your nervous system and it conducts electricity. So just like we're measuring electricity in the brain with EEG, we're also measuring electricity in your palms and fingers. And that's exactly what Damasio did in this experiment, to measure the extent to which people were having a strong emotional reaction, like excitement or nervousness. And so let's look at the results. Now, I promised you that the results were complex. I also promised you that I was going to simplify this and break this down into something that is really easily obtainable um, to understand. Uh, but you do have to really tune into this. Otherwise, you'll really miss the key lessons. And so I'm going to take all this mess of data, and I'm going to make it all go away and bring it back one step at a time to understand what did Damasio learn about emotions and decision-making and how can we apply that today? This is a phenomenal study. You're, you're going to hopefully enjoy hearing something that you don't want to go read the academic literature on um, because that would be perhaps less fun, uh, except for a few of you in the crowd who I know would enjoy doing that. So first of all, let's look at the participants with no, no brain lesion, right? Healthy human brains. They went through various phases, right? At first, they don't know which are the good decks, which are the bad decks. I'm drawing from these decks. Um, some are good, some are bad. Sometimes I win, sometimes I lose. And so there's this kind of this baseline. And then there's this phase that they labeled the pre-hunch phase. And the pre-hunch phase, like, I can't quite say that I have a hunch of how this game is played. I can't explain in any way, oh, there's two good decks and two bad decks, and I think I'm starting to get a hunch here. But there's something inside of you that's starting to make you choose better. And then you get to start having a hunch. And you're still not sure, but you're like, let me start testing out my hunches. And everyone that didn't have a brain lesion got through to this phase. And 70% of the people were also able to then at the, by the end of the game say, I got it. There's two good decks. There's two bad decks. It's better for me to draw from this than from that. And let me go ahead and do that and I'm gonna win this game. And so they were able to conceptually describe how to win the game. Okay, now let's look at the results. So first of all, behaviorally, did they draw the right cards? So during that beginning phase, that pre-punishment phase, right? They're just, they're just trying it out. They're drawing some good decks. They're drawing from the bad decks, a little bit more from the bad decks, um, but essentially equivalent statistically, because um, they're just still trying to figure it out. By the time they get to the pre-hunch phase, the white bars are the good decks, right? So already, even though they, just, they can't even quite articulate anything, they already are starting to choose the better decks. So they can't explain why, but they're starting to choose from the good decks. Then they get in their hunch, and they're like, I have a hunch, maybe this is how it works. And even more, they start choosing from the good decks. And then they're like, ah, I got it, I understand the rules. And then overwhelmingly, they're choosing from the good decks. So we know that something's going on where they're able to go through this process and get to the point where they essentially, let's say, win the game or perform well at the game where they're choosing the, from the good decks that pay out more money and lose less often. What happened emotionally? Emotionally, during the pre-punishment phase, as measured by, call it palm sweatiness, electrodermal activity, GSR, just think about like when you get a little nervous, right? You get a little nervous, your palms sweat a little bit. In the beginning, good deck, bad deck, like, no significant difference. By the pre-hunch phase, you're starting to see that they get a little bit more of that palm sweatiness, that like emotional activation, um, when they go for the bad decks. By the hunch phase, and it's like, I have a hunch that maybe this is how this works. I can't describe it yet, but as I reach for the cards, I actually am feeling a little bit nervous. And they don't consciously recognize that nervousness, but it can be measured on the electrical conductance in their skin, right? And it can be measured by that palm sweatiness. And then once they actually get the rules, like, got it, 
here's how it works, good decks, bad decks, I'm gonna finish out this game. They're not nervous when they're drawing from the good decks, but they do have this like, if they're reaching for the bad deck, they have this like impulsive nervousness of, um, uh-oh, like something in my body is telling me that this is not the right decision. So that's how it works. Like that's how, how it would work for uh, you playing this game. What about the people who like Phineas Gage were missing uh, or had a damaged ventromedial prefrontal cortex. Well, they went through similar phases. They would have a pre-punishment phase, just a baseline. They would get a pre-hunch, and 50% of them actually could explain the rules. They could say, hey, I got it. This is how it works. And they could actually rationally, consciously explain the rules. What did that mean behaviorally? What did that mean emotionally? Well, first of all, let's look at, did they draw good decks or bad decks? And in general, they uh, didn't, they, they drew bad decks a little bit more, just slightly more than good decks. So even though they got to a point where they could ex conceptually explain by the end, like, I get it, these are the better decks, they still couldn't make rational decisions. Even though they could explain to you, I understand the rules, they still couldn't bring themselves to, as they're playing the game, like make a rational decision. Now, how does that exhibit emotionally, right? So you have one group without damaged brain uh, region in that area, um, who's making good decisions, even before they can explain it. And then you have another group with that brain damage, um, not able to make a rational decision, even if they could explain it by the end. And what we see on the emotional scale is that they just generally didn't emote. They generally didn't feel any of that nervousness. Um, their emotional reactions were kind of nil, really insignificant. And so this is further evidence to explain that grand statement that I said earlier, which is you can't make a rational decision without some emotional input. So if some little cues in your body that you're not even conscious of, like your palms sweating a little bit, your heart rate increasing, you're breathing a little faster, um, you can't make a rational decision. And so hopefully um, you follow that. Um, I know it's a lot of info to take in, but it is one of the most uh, important pieces of research of that time to understand that ultimately emotions and decision making are intrinsically intertwined. And so what are the key takeaways, even if you weren't following every step of what every graph meant? Well, A, we know that emotion drives behaviors. And we know that emotion is driving you to make decisions even before you can rationally understand or rationally explain why. Emotion is driving your behaviors, driving your decisions. Um, also, it's happening subconsciously. You can't report on it. You don't say, you know what, my palms are getting sweaty, so I'm not going to draw from that. You're not aware of that consciously. It's happening at such subtle, level, sub, subtle levels, but subconsciously something is telling you. Your emotions are telling you, I think we should go for this one. And those instincts are important and those instincts can be trusted. And when you actually link um, the fact that emotion is crucial to all decision-making, then we have something that is just incredibly important as a key takeaway. Emotions and decisions are intrinsically intertwined. You cannot have one without the other. When you want your customers or anyone to make any decision, when you want to influence people, if emotions are not a part of that process, it won't work. Emotions are critical. All right, we got through the beginning. And now we're gonna say, like, so what? Like, how do, we, how do we deal with this? What does this really mean for advertising? So what is the impact on advertising? Um, well, let's just take Verizon as an example. Verizon has these sort of factual um, things that are part of their messaging, right? America's largest, most reliable network. And they give you these check boxes, most coverage, most speed, most reliable. Now, these are all things that are, they would argue, like these are what they would say, these are the facts that we're presenting to you. So the question is, can they take that and make it emotional or even more emotional? 
And so we're going to take a look at an ad from the Super Bowl this year that attempts to take that message of um, we are the world's most reliable network into an emotional story. Later in the, in the presentation, I'm gonna show you the same ad again, but I'm gonna show it to you with the overlay of people's emotional reactions as measured by our studies. And so you're gonna see it now just on its own, so you're not distracted by the graphs. And Hi, my name is Anthony Lynn. In 2005, I was in a horrible car accident. I was hit by a car going 50 miles an hour, and I promise you I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for the first responders. They told me that I flew 45, 50 feet in the air. The doctor told me, so you're very, you're very lucky. It was a miracle. Hi, hey, Coach. My name is Jim Brittle. This is my partner, Craig Kelly. We're the first two first responders on scene. Coach, my name is Skyla Bosco. I was the paramedic on Medic Engine 1 that evening. I've often thought about you know, who showed up that night. I never thought I'd see you. I mean, that's it's unbelievable. They said I had to have some angels with me that night to survive. I believe you guys are angels. Thank you, guys. Thank you. So there is a there is a, a commercial that takes a rational message, America's most reliable network, and ties it to emotion. And you know, when you play this for a big crowd, I always catch somebody, like a few people in the audience, actually shedding tears. So it really is evoking emotions. I'm excited later in the presentation to show you the data. Like, what did we really measure moment by moment? But when you think about what that commercial did and how it makes people feel, um, the main message is that first responders answer the call. Our job is to make sure they get it. That is an emotional story, an emotional way of saying we're reliable. Now, rationally, like I've overanalyzed this commercial a million times. Like, well, wait a minute, if I have AT&T or like, wouldn't, wouldn't they still get the call? Like, and you can overanalyze and overanalyze. And yet, nonetheless, when you look at the uh, brain activity data and other neuro neurometrics that we collected. This was one of the most emotionally provocative ads. Um, when you look at the amount of social media sharing it got, the amount of tweets, the amount of uh, comments, and the sentiment around all of that, um, it was incredibly active, much more than many other commercials. When you look at like the big USA Today, like how did this rank overall, it was one of the best performing ads. And what they did is they told a really emotional story and tied that to their brand and tied that to the idea of being reliable. Later, we'll show a little bit more about how this works. But now we're going to get into the next study. And I love this study because now we're going to say, okay, we've already established emotions are critical. And I showed you some really interesting evidence to say, you cannot make a decision without emotions. Now we're saying, well, well what, which emotions? Are all emotions are created equal? And does that actually carry over into people's purchasing decisions? Do people buy differently depending on what emotions you induce in them? And that is a really interesting question. And certainly for everyone on the line who's involved in advertising, entertainment, um, very interesting question. So this study worked like this. A little easier design. Um, they uh, had three different emotions that uh, that groups would experience. So one group was the neutral group. They showed them just like neutral emotion. I'll show you what it, some of the examples. Then they showed like a really disgusting, like just a gross, gross movie scene. Um, and that was another condition of the study, right? A different group. Um, and then they showed this really just like heart-wrenchingly sad scene. After that, they asked people to make decisions about, hey, how much would you sell this for? Hey, how much would you buy this for? Now there's this thing between selling and buying that I'm gonna get into a little bit, but let's just focus on the buy part because ultimately what this audience wants to know is um, what influences what people buy. So for each case, you saw something neutral, how much are you gonna buy the product for? You saw something disgusting, how much are you gonna buy the product for? You saw something sadness, how much are you gonna buy the product for? 
contract for. In other words, what are your purchasing decisions? What are your purchasing behaviors? What is your willingness to pay? And so now we're linking emotions to what will people pay and looking at if there's differences in different emotions. Um, and this opens up a whole interesting set of questions. So first of all, as with any study, start with the baseline, you get an emotional baseline state. Then they would show people these things that would induce emotions. So this is the disgusting scene. I know it's hard to see. That's a guy upside down in a toilet in the dirtiest bathroom you've ever seen. I mean, it's just like, it's a scene from a movie that is absolutely gross. I think the movie's train spotting. Um, neutral scene, just kind of like underwater, like nothing really uh, major happening, but just kind of, again, a scene from a movie. And this is the sad scene. I've seen from movies just like heartbreakingly sad. And so after that, they would say, okay, thank you so much. That was part of the study. We just wanted you to tell us what emotion you felt and like write down what emotion you felt. And so then they said, now we're gonna do a different study. And this time we're going to have you decide how much you would sell this product for. It happened to be highlighters or how much would you buy this product for? And again, let's just focus a little bit more on the buy side. So they had to choose between 50 cents and $14. So you've got these highlighters, how much would you buy them for? And tell me between 50 cents and $14, how much are these things worth? And does somehow emotion change how much you think they're worth? What you would actually pay? Well, let's take a look. So the neutral side. Um, first of all, I will quickly explain the endowment effect. The endowment effect is that when you own something and you're deciding how much to sell it for, you value it more than if you don't own it yet and you're deciding how much to buy it for. So the white line being higher than the green line is important because it shows that the endowment effect, which has been proven numerous times, is working. People value the things they own more than the things that they're going to buy, right? If you're selling your house, you think it's worth more than the people coming trying to buy it. And so that endowment effect is the difference between the white line and the green line, but we're not gonna worry about that too much. I just wanna explain that. Um, focus on the green line. So in the neutral condition, what is the baseline? How much do people wanna buy the highlighters for? So let's say around $3.50, right? It's sort of like in there, like getting close to $4. Um, then we had people who were just like exposed to a disgusting scene in a movie and then kind of separately, like they were told it was a different experiment, how much would you buy the highlighters for? So first of all, the endowment effect went away. Um, and because people just like felt disgusted, suddenly they would pay less for the product. Like feeling the emotion of disgust made them value the product less, made them want to buy it less or think it's worth less. Amazing. Um, what about sadness? Well, suddenly, A, the endowment effect reversed, right? People actually wanted to buy things even more than they wanted to sell things. So like that is, you know, the total change in how people value. But most importantly, let's look at the, at the green line. People are now wanting to buy the product for a higher price than when they were neutral, let alone when they were previously disgusted. So sadness is an emotion that actually can influence your purchasing decisions and make something more valuable to you and worth more money to you because it goes from uh, between three and four dollars to nearing five dollars in how much you're willing to pay for those highlighters. So now what have we learned? This study taught us that emotions that are unrelated to like this other decision, right? As you would put emotions into your advertising, for example, carry over. And those emotions affect your decision making. They affect your purchasing. Um, we also learned that not all emotions are created equal. Some emotions make you want to value things less, like disgust. Some emotions make you want to value things more. And surprisingly to many, because people focus a lot on happiness, even sadness is an emotion that makes you value things more and want to buy it for a higher price. Now, don't worry, like sadness isn't the only emotion that can do that. That just happens to be the emotion that this study focused on. 
we've done a lot of research and have some really interesting research plan um, to dig into more details around every other emotion under the sun, um, including complex emotions, way beyond the basic emotions. So the key takeaway here is that emotions can influence what your purchasing decisions are and not every emotion is created equal. Now, let's go back to that Verizon example. I played you this ad before, um, but without the graphs. Now you'll remember that the green line is the attention and the red line is the emotion. Because this presentation is focused on emotion, let's pay a special attention to the red line. And I'm not gonna play the entire ad again, but we're gonna show that, okay, there's this little drop off here, which again, when you only drop emotion for a, for a split second, um, that often is a setup for a really high and then retained spike. And so, and that's what we see. We see a huge spike in emotion. It goes, um, you know, all the way up to about seven, um, nearing seven. And that on the, like for an advertisement to get you to an emotional level of seven, like sure, we see that like when we're testing full movies, but that is a, that is a huge success in the context of a lot of other ads. So let me just fast forward and play like, what was that key emotional moment that got people to really connect? This is my partner, Craig Kelly. We're the first two first responders on the scene. Coach, my name is Skyla Bosco. I was the paramedic on Medic Engine 1 that evening. I've often thought about it, though, who showed up that night. I never thought I'd see you. Hi, my name is... All right, so when we look at that, like it's it's... I mean, that is a massive emotional spike. It happens really quickly and it sustains for a long period of time, right? Like you, emotion starts going up around 30 seconds and it stays really high for over 10 seconds. That's a long time for your brain to like stay very emotionally engaged. And of course, attention is not dropping during that period either. It's maintaining um, because emotion really also influences how much you pay attention. And so that's an example of an ad that did use emotion in an effective way. Let's see about some other examples though. What can we compare that against? Well, it's not always easy and not every product lends itself to being emotional. And so uh, knowing that, um, you know, we need to understand what else is going on here. So um, rational projects can be, can be a challenge. Like Verizon, for example, is like, it's a rational product. Like we need a cell carrier, but they made it emotional. Here's another Super Bowl ad. And now look at the emotion curve. Remember that the one I just showed you was spiking emotion to around seven. This ad never really even gets above three or barely above three. And if I play this ad for you, which I will right now, I want you to pay attention for like, why does this ad, why is it not successful in evoking emotions? And then let's talk about what we can do about it. Real protection isn't just about video doorbell or voice assistance either. It's not even about accessing your entire security system with one touch or checking your indoor and outdoor cameras. It's not only about helping protect your loved ones when they're away from home. Real protection is much more. It's about you having all of this combined from the most trusted name in security, ADT. By the way, you're gonna be seeing a whole lot more from us in ADT. All right, so listen. That commercial did not evoke any strong emotion. Like I said, the red line emotion, like it stays in a really neutral zone. Why is that? Well, it was a bunch of product shots and a voiceover telling you a bunch of facts. If you're thinking now, like, did I even catch what they said? It was hard because it wasn't really told in an emotional way and emotions help you remember things. And so it was lacking and there is a better way to do it, right? We're talking about home security. We're talking about protecting your family. Like there is definitely an emotional story in there. And so that is what advertisers really need to be able to do, is to be able to understand how emotion can influence decision-making, change purchasing decisions. And finally, we're gonna move on to our final study in order before we wrap up. And this is where we get really exciting because we're saying, can this brain activity stuff that I've been preaching about, can it actually predict what happens in the real world, what people buy and what people do and what decisions people make. And this study is one of my favorite studies of all time. Um, Emily Falk is an amazing researcher um, and, uh, and, and this research 
um, done out of Columbia is absolutely phenomenal. So can brain data be a predictor? Well, in this case, we were, they were looking at smoking cessation. Can we create advertisements that get people to want to quit smoking? And so into an MRI, they scanned the brains of 46 smokers. Separately from those 46 smokers where you get brain data, they also sent those same ads to 400,000 people in an email campaign, also smokers. And the question is, does the brain data from a small number of people, the less than 50 people, predict what happens with a large number of people at scale when those same ads are used? And here is how it works. So there were a, a range, tons of different advertisements that were tested. Some were neutral, like the first image that you're seeing. Some were really emotional, like the guy with the hole in his throat smoking a cigarette with uh, missing teeth. And stop smoking, start living was the same you know, messaging that they used for both. Then they would ask like, hey, how likely does this make you to want to quit smoking? So let's get a self-report on this. From one to five, like, do you want to quit? Like one being like, no, this is not making me want to quit. Five, like, yes, this makes me want to quit. And then in the group B, right, the 400,000 people who got the email campaign, depending on which ad they saw, click here for the patches to, you know, and, and we'll send you the patches to help you quit. So like, there actually is a conversion, right? They have to click and put in their address and get the patches, right? And they would get patches to help them quit smoking. So what are the results in, in, uh, in the last moments of the, the uh, webinar here? We're gonna get into something that I think is absolutely fascinating and important to understand. So first of all, click-through rates. The emotional images had significantly higher click-through rates than the, than, the, than the just neutral images. And that should be no surprise, right? We already went over how important emotion is to evoke and how it affects people's behaviors. So good to know, good to know emotion works. Got it. What happened with the 46 people whose brains were scanned as they watched these different images, these different advertisements? Well, first of all, their medial prefrontal cortex, and in particular, their ventral medial prefrontal cortex, was sometimes more activated and sometimes not. Remember, same thing that Damasio studied, same region that Phineas Gage lost, this area of the brain that we know is important in connecting emotion to decision-making and placing value, placing value on things. And so what did the results show? First question, what did the self-report results show? You saw this ad, maybe it was really emotional, maybe it was really neutral. Um, uh, how much does this make you want to quit smoking? Well, whether or not that predicted what 400,000 people in an email campaign did in real life was not statistically significant. That is to say, the survey did not predict in any way whether or not people would be persuaded by the message. The survey didn't work for identifying which ads would be more or less persuasive. What about the brain data? Well, with the brain data, actually seeing activation in that area of the brain uh, actually explained 60% of the variance um, of whether or not people actually made a decision to click. So the ads that had more emotion, more activation in that area of the brain, that's what they valued what they're seeing, right? That they're connecting emotion and rational decisions, right? The, air, the people who actually had that area of the brain activated, um, that predicted which ads would actually work amongst sending it to 400,000 people. In other words, scan 50 brains see which things work, and then put it at scale, and you will know much better than a survey which is going to work. So again, the survey didn't explain it. The survey didn't predict people's behavior when translated onto 400,000 people receiving the campaign, whereas which images actually activated this important region of the brain did predict which ads would be more successful 
in getting people to convert, to click to get the patches. And if you actually combine these data, then you would see that it actually explains 65% of the variance. So when you actually layer in the self-report survey data with the brain data, you do get an enhanced effect. So that is the content that I have to present to you today. I will in my last minute uh, summarize what we learned. We learned, uh, of course, from that study that brain activity can predict population level reactions. Um, and measuring specific areas of the brain are especially important. And on its own, survey data did not predict what would happen in the real world, but brain data turned out to be a very good predictor of what happened in the real world. Um, and neuroscience, therefore, especially now that it's become so much more accessible outside of academic labs, can be incredibly effective to quantify emotion and therefore quantify the effectiveness of your messaging, your advertising. And this can all be done um, today. Uh, overall, what did we go over today? Emotions and decisions are intertwined. You can't separate them. They are part of the same. Priming emotional states um, actually changes how much people are willing to pay for a product. It changes the decisions based on what emotion you induce, and not all emotions are created equal. The research tools have evolved to allow us to actually read people's brain activity and other neurological and biometric that, um, that work even better than self-report. Um, and that this is accessible to everyone today. We don't actually have time for questions because we're really running up at the exact one o'clock hour. And I know everyone has meetings to get to, but I would ask that if you have questions, I'm going to send you guys an email. And I'm going to say, hey, want to get in touch and feel free to respond. I'm going to personally send those who attended the, the webinar and email um, and see if, uh, if there's something more you want to learn, something more you want to discuss. And of course, feel free to follow us. Go to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash sparkneuro. There's some really interesting short videos on there, including about emotion and decision making, about storytelling that teach really interesting lessons. So thank you all so much. I hope that you enjoyed this. We took some really complex science and we boiled it down into key actionable findings that you can apply as you think about emotion and how it applies to your decision-making process. Um, fantastic. I see that some of the attendees are chatting me with a big thank you in the private chat. I really appreciate that. It's nice to hear. Um, and I appreciate you all for staying with us and, and, and staying tuned. It looks like, um, Everyone stuck around for the whole presentation, and that's a flattering metric, and I hope that everyone really enjoyed it. Oh, thank <laughs> I'm getting some private messages saying great session, thank you, etc. Um, and I really do appreciate that. But again, I'm going to email um, you folks and uh, give you an opportunity to ask questions since we didn't have time to get to questions today. Um, I'm going to stay on, though, for a little bit because I am enjoying all of the private chats where people are um, uh, expressing gratitude. So um, uh, I will stay on for just a moment as we wrap up, but certainly now is the time. Uh, feel free to drop off, get to your next meeting. Um, I do see that there's still about 50 people on. Um, so if there was a pressing question that someone wanted to ask, feel free to put that into the questions area. Um, oh, and I see that some people are saying, I'm going to YouTube right now. I appreciate that. Um, uh, I think you'll find some really good stuff there on YouTube, especially look for the, uh, the emotional decision making video and especially look for um, the storytelling video. I love, I think those are really interesting lessons. Oh, thank you. Uh, I'm just reading some of the comments. Um, yes, feel free to drop off. Um, but I do do really appreciate the feedback that I'm getting in these chats here. You never know when you're presenting to a blank wall with everybody online how you're responding. So much appreciated. Um, I do see a question that came into these chats. It says, do we have examples of testing different digital media formats uh, and platforms with sound off? Yes, um, we do. Um, and that is especially critical when you're talking about social environments. Um, uh, this applies whether you're talking about YouTube, skippable, non-skippable, pre-roll, mid-roll, um, social media, and, uh, and of course, television. We do full movies. We do pilot TV shows. We do movie trailers. We do ads. 
We also do work for the Department of Defense in counterterrorism. Um, and soon we will be announcing uh, a new division that's more on the healthcare side, more news to come on that. Thank you for the question, Haley. Um, all right, folks, um, I'm gonna go ahead and let everyone drop off and I'm gonna close out the session. Um, uh, but I do appreciate that, that many of you are still sticking around. We'll all get in touch with you over email or feel free to email us um, uh, and, uh, and to follow up. I look forward to chatting with many of you. Thanks again. And I'm just gonna close out the session. Have a great, great, great rest of the day. Bye now.